So g- good afternoon. Um, uh, w- welcome, welcome uh, to uh, the School of Public and uh, International Affairs. Um, I'm Harold James from the History Department and from Spear, um, and it's it's really a great pleasure to have all of you here in person um, in what has become really a very odd format, and we're still getting used to this. So thank you, uh, thank you for being here. Um, I, I have to give a few housekeeping rules at the beginning. Um, the talk is recorded for later publication on the web. Um, uh, you should keep your mask on at all times, um, except if you're speaking to the microphone. Um, if you haven't already scanned the QR code outside, please do so after the talk. And after the talk, uh, John is going to be outside, and there are uh, copies of the book, probably not enough for everybody here, so rush to make sure that you get one, please. Um, scarce resource. Um, the, the talk uh, today is hosted by the Julius Rabinowitz Center for Public Policy and Finance, uh, by the Griswold Center uh, for Economic Policy Studies, and by the Economic History Workshop. That's a joint effort between uh, history and uh, Julius Rabinowitz. Um, and most importantly, uh, John is here. Um, uh, John Levy is a professor in the Department of History at the University of Chicago. He's a member of the Committee on Social Thought. He's the faculty director of the Law, Letters, and Society program. Uh, but we know him, of course, because he was uh, a very, very esteemed colleague uh, for some time. And uh, so he, it's really great uh, uh, John, to, to have you back. He's a historian of economic life, um, and his interests range very, very widely. His first book, um, Freaks of Fortune, The Emerging World of Capitalism and Risk in America, was published by Harvard University Press in 2012. It won a lot of awards. I mean, I, should I read them all out? The Organization of American Historians, Frederick Jackson Turner Award, the LSW Hawley Prize, the Avery O'Grave Craven Award, the American Society for Legal Histories, William Nelson Cromwell Book Prize, and many, many others. Um, so uh, great, uh, great to have you here. Uh, but you're talking now about your new book, which is up there on the screen, uh, Ages of American Capitalism, A History of the United States, that was published uh, this summer by Random House. And uh, some of you, I think, have read it because I, I've seen some copies in people's hands. But if you haven't read it, uh, you really should read it. It's, it's an absolutely wonderful, wonderful book. Um, and uh, I, I just thought maybe I should say uh, three things about it uh, that uh, I like particularly and that I think it does in a way that other books don't really do. Uh, first of all, there's an enormous literature, as I think many of you know, on the history of capitalism. Uh, but most of that literature uh, doesn't really try to define or even to grapple seriously with what capitalism is or what capitalism could be conceived of. And uh, John uh, thinks about that uh, very, very seriously. Um, second, it, it wrestles uh, with the problem of a kind of tension uh, between people's proclivity to hoard stuff and not to spend. And uh, we're, after all, in a period now when a lot of us have not been spending for a lot of time, uh, partly, obviously, because of the circumstances. Um, The tension between hoarding, uh, proclivity to hoard, and investing, and uh, what drives investment, and what kinds of calculation drive investment, uh, many, many considerations of that, but beautiful description of the tension um, between needing to take risk when you do investment, and on the other hand, having a great capacity for organization. And uh, in the central chapters, the rise of industrial capitalism is really uh, beautifully uh, described. But that tension between hoarding and investment uh, seemed to me, when I looked at it, very, very familiar, uh, because that's the world, held by the accent, I, uh, I'm from a, uh, the UK originally, but I grew up in Cambridge, and uh, Cambridge is still really dominated by the legacy of John Maynard Keynes, and there's a very Keynesian uh, 
uh, element of the story uh, that uh, John is telling. Uh, but thirdly, um, it is, a, in, in a sense, an economic history, but it's not just an economic history. Um, it's a history of the United States uh, in, in the title. And uh, this is really, really unique. In fact, it's difficult to think of somebody since the Beards, uh, so that's a long, long time ago, um, who really put the economic character of the Constitution right at the center of a sustained analysis of American history. Uh, so uh, these are the three of the things, very briefly, that appeal to me. Uh, but I think you will find many, many more appealing things uh, when John speaks. So it's a great pleasure, John, to welcome you here and to ask you to speak about your new book. Thank you. Good afternoon. I mean, what a pleasure uh, to be here. As Harold mentioned, I spent many, many good years here at Princeton, for which I'm, I'll always remain uh, grateful. I think this is the only time I've had the opportunity to talk about the book in person, and it's quite fitting that I, uh, that I do it here. It feels like coming full circle. It's also true that this book uh, first emerged out of a course that I taught for some years here at Princeton uh, called The History of American Capitalism. So in some sense, welcome to History 379. And, uh, precepts start this week. I haven't said the word precept uh, for some years. I wanted to say it. All right. Uh, Ages of American Capitalism is a history of American economic life uh, from the English colonization of North America in the 17th century through the Great Recession. I stopped in 2010. And, and what I want to do today is introduce the book, give you some sense of it. I can't possibly summarize uh, everything, uh, but what I'll do is start with an overview of the first half of the book, uh, then, which goes up to about the Great Depression, Great Depression. Then for the second half of the book, I want to focus on one moment in particular, uh, the early 1980s, which is the hinge between the third and the final fourth age of American capitalism uh, in the book. But in between, indeed, there will be a diversion through uh, John Maynard Keynes uh, to introduce just a bit of the book's conceptual apparatus and also one of its main arguments, um, which Harold al already very eloquently uh, described. So an overview of the first half of the book, and then second, I'll step back and there'll be some the, the mumbo jumbo about liquidity preference, but not too much. And then third, finally touching down around 1980 to kind of introduce uh, some of the major arcs and arguments about the second half of the book, which really cover the 20th century through uh, the 21st century, the first decade. All right, so the first two ages of American capitalism. The first is the age of commerce uh, from the successful reconstitution of English imperial power uh, on the North American seaboard in the 1660s after the English Civil War, uh, up through the American Civil War of the 1860s. And, and one aspiration of the book is, is to integrate uh, economic matters with those often kept separate, whether it's politics or environment or psyche or culture or law. And one way I, I attempt to do that in the book is through uh, visual sources, painting uh, photographs, architecture. So I thought I just want to give uh, some sense of that here. This is from the first part of the book, Hudson River School. You can see uh, this sense of an open American continent with encroaching kind of commerce and encroaching industrialization coming uh, to the West. The age of commerce saw commerce become a critical affair of state among European empires. It thus saw the dramatic imperial expansion markets across space in North America, uh, first by the British Empire and then by the United States. Uh, this era, I argue, was defined by Smithian uh, growth, invoking Adam Smith, economic development driven by the extent of commercial markets, facilitated, I argue, by imperial expansion. The main theme of this age, this part of the book, is really the geopolitics of commerce. There's some maps and trade patterns of the British Empire, and I have an argument that they translate actually to trade patterns on the continent of the early United States. Um, 
most central to this imperial expansion um, was a highly commercial form of racial slavery. Uh, this is war news from Mexico uh, about the uh, continuing spread, the possibility of the spread of, of, of slavery uh, into the old Southwest. And here you see uh, the geographical distribution of slaves as a percent of population by 1860. The abolition of slavery marks the beginning of the second age, uh, the age of capital. Oh, I'm sorry. First, I wanted to say uh, that this part of the book covers moral debates about commerce. It also covers uh, the role of the household as the central unit of economic life. It talks about the rise of the corporation as a dominant form of U.S. enterprise uh, before it deals with the coming uh, of the Civil War. Uh, this is slave prices. You can see they fluctuate with the politics of sexualism in the 1850s. Okay, now we're ready for the second age, uh, the age of, of capital. Railroads, this is a map of railroads in the panic of 1873. Railroads still furthered uh, the extent of markets across space, now facilitated by the U.S. Army's uh, conquering of the Trans Mississippi West. But it's also an era of industrial revolution or the extraordinary intensification of production in place over time through the application of fossil fuel energy uh, via fixed capital investment. This another genre of landscape, uh, if you will, through photographs of the early oil derrick in Pennsylvania. And this part of the book has a section on Chicago as the kind of preeminent industrial city of this era. Uh, this is man standing on crust sewage in Bubbly Creek. Chicago. All right. In this part of the book, uh, some of the great entrepreneur, entrepreneurial sagas of American history, Carnegie Gould Ford, this is J.P. Morgan. You can see the, one of the reasons why the photograph is famous. The chair, it looks like he's clutching a knife with his left hand there. Um, up here, I cover wage labor, the rise of wage labor, immigrant working class formation, um, the industrialization of the countryside, and the populist farmer revolt. Um, class conflict from the railroad strike of 1877. Uh, here's the slide for the populist revolt. Wheat prices in this era go down. So that's a simple message. Um, the transformation of the pre industrial household into the male breadwinner, female homemaker family of the industrial area, which removes women from commerce and commercial relations. This is John Singer Sargent's uh, great painting uh, that deals with that theme. And then the associated split that tracks gender uh, between for-profit and non-profit corporations, the rise of modern philanthropy as we know it, uh, shows you the rise, kind of a rough metric of the rise of non-profit associations in this period in the late 19th century. I call it the age of capital because of industrial revolution, uh, but I also underscore a second related uh, but distinct dynamic, and that's the rise of modern finance and the appearance of macroeconomic volatility uh, due to the credit cycle. So both industrial revolution and financial volatility culminate in the 1920s with the birth of Fordism, another landscape, another picture of landscape uh, that evokes the Hudson River School. You can actually see the tiny person on the track left in the yellow railroad car, uh, Charles Sheeler's uh, account of, of Henry Ford's River Rouge uh, factory, the largest factory in the world at that time. So the 1920s, uh, the birth of Fordism, or mass production, the electrification of the assembly line. Ah, that's a callback to Durant's uh, uh, landscape painting of, uh, from the age of commerce. Um, the rise of the electric assembly line, electrification, uh, but then financial volatility, also uh, the Great Depression. This is uh, Black Tuesday. All right, the third age, the age of control, last from the Great Depression through 1980, but then the final age from 1980 through the present, I still think, although one would have to call the question, uh, which I call the age of chaos. And I guess rather than briefly summarizing these last two ages, let me build out toward their main contours from a more focused discussion of, a, of, of an event, of a turning point. But first, I want to pivot somewhat sharply um, to this. Uh, so I draw from a number of economic thinkers in the book. I mentioned Adam Smith already briefly. 
Uh, but indeed, Keynes is, is central. And this is Keynes from the general theory, uh, writing during the, uh, the Great Depression. There has been a chronic tendency throughout human history for the propensity to save to be stronger than the inducement to invest. So what did Keynes really mean in the general theory? What was his real message? Who cares? At least I don't care. I don't think it's an important question. I mean, there's no one clear message to a book of this kind. Paul Krugman once divided uh, book one, Keynesians, theorists of effective demand, uh, from what he called chapter 12, Keynesians, uh, theorists of radical uncertainty. And I guess I've become maybe, maybe the first, there's probably other chapter 23 of Keynesians, um, chapter 23 being the only historical chapter in the general theory. But what Keynes is saying here, all things being equal, owners of capital prefer to hoard their wealth rather than part with liquidity to carry the risk of a long-term investment. All things being equal, the inducement to invest long-term in productive enterprise is rather weak with bad consequences given that investment any possibly minimally gains in account, and mine is one, uh, is the most dynamic factor in economic development. Keynes wrote propensity to save here, but usually he writes horn, which in his lexicon means liquidity preference. So it's liquidity that owners of wealth prefer to durable, committed investment in enterprise, production, and labor. Now, when we think of liquidity, we typically just think of money as cash. The central bank injects liquidity. There's more cash out there. Money for use in transactions. In my case, I actually do think is you know faithful to his uh, own thinking. Money, uh, it's not a mere means of transaction, so it's not in that sense neutral. It's not a flow uh, variable. It's not a question of velocity or of transaction demand. Money is a stock. Uh, it's a capital asset. A liquidity preference speaks to the speculative and also the precautionary demand for liquid assets. Liquid assets are ones that, firstly, store value over time, and second, are easily transactable. So they always have a willing buyer. The owners of wealth must choose where to invest, which forms of capital to own or hold with in the institutional setup that is capitalism, money, and also money-like assets, counting among the choices, and none of these choices are, are neutral. So historically, from the assets that wealth owners hold, whether they be land, slaves, real estate, factories, credit instruments, or money, qualitative patterns, enterprise, production, labor, can follow. So it's that process, Investment, first mover, working its way over time through production, exchange, consumption, back to investment with each step in the sequence set in its necessary historical context. That's like the economic vision of the book, and that's the conceptualization of capitalism. And I mentioned qualitative patterns. So if, say, the political, legal systems, norms, desires for racial domination allow or favor it, Capital ownership can manifest, say, in a slave society with a strong tendency towards imperial territorial expansion. And qualitatively, labor would then take the form of the master-slave relation with its own unique social and psychological dynamics or its own patterns of violence. If we have uh, prodigious fixed investments in technologically innovative factories with economies of scale, you know, wage labor may come to the fore with its own dynamic or its own patterns of, of violence. This is from a famous strike in 1937 um, in which Ford Motor Company employees beat up uh, striking workers. Okay. At the same time, at the same time, liquidity preference brings into the picture quantities. So money might be the most liquid asset, but it produces nothing. And so liquidity preference, all things being equal, means lower demand, lower output, lower productivity, lower in terms of the, uh, fewer employment of resources, including labor, 
higher inequality, unrealized economic potential. So liquidity preference means essentially you know, a very inegalitarian form of frontier capitalism. What that means is that historically, eras that have seen the great expansion of productivity and wealth, for good or for ill, in the book, Early American Imperial Commercial Expansion, the Slave Economy, Industrial Revolution, the post-World War II boom, they typically involve capital investment in illiquid assets. So back to something like Ford's River Rouge. These are assets, forms of capital that depreciate through use. They lose value, but they trap investment long-term in enterprise, labor, and production that multiplies wealth and leads to economic development. But again, Keynes's point is that historically we should not expect to see that happen. We should expect liquidity preference to rule and the inducement to investment to be weak. Why? I mean, Keynes has a psychology here. I'm not going to go into it too much, although I think you could. I don't do it in the book. I mean, I think you could make it work with some versions of prospect theory or behavioral accounts of, of rationality, irrationality, and so forth. But just to note that. But the basic point, without putting in the trappings of any theory, is that the speculative and precautionary demand for liquid assets can work in unison, uh, expressing a desire to keep all investment options open for speculative gain without ever bearing the risk of loss. This is really the ultimate capitalist fantasy, right? Immediate entry and exit into all asset classes in pursuit of short-term speculative gain with no risk of loss. So if you can have that, you know, why not get it? I keep saying all things being equal, liquidity preference, but of course all things aren't always equal. And so the book explores many of the factors that strengthen historically the inducement to invest. The kind of idiosyncratic, idiosyncratic histories of people like Henry Ford, like he's a really weird guy, he's obsessed with production, and he wants to produce, produce. Uh, earlier, the wide distribution of, of land among white households in the earlier public reflects a desire for household independence and reflects a political ideology of male property owning democracy. Slavery, white slave owners' desires for racial domination induce investment in black slaves. Uh, later, working class demands for employment induced corporate investment after World War II. Uh, so I could you know, talk about many examples, and, and the book recounts many of them, but to step back, I mean, the key actor in the book uh, is the state. So it's the state that has the most capacity to energize uh, or enervate the inducement to invest. And so the relationship between politics, uh, exactly as Harold said, I mean, the relationship between politics and investment is really at the heart of the book. Here, wars loom large. So 17th century imperial conflict between Britain and France, what launches American commerce, Civil War of the 1860s, the Indian Wars, that's the theme for Industrial Revolution. Fordism, of course, was a highly militaristic social formation. It's aided by the First and Second World Wars, uh, lays the foundation for the post-World War II fixed investment boom. All right, on the flip side, on the flip side, exercise liquidity preference, weakening investment, Owners of wealth need the state to create suitable conditions. And I said the fantasy of riskless returns on capital motivates the at once speculative and precautionary demand for liquid assets. And that fantasy arguably, arguably, is a situation we have today because of the degree to which central banks are willing to backstop asset prices. So, so how, do we get in, how did we get into that? Uh, Here's a Princeton guy, right? So, so let me now transfer, or let me now transition to the Volcker shock, uh, the, the dramatic turn to, to monetarism by the U.S. Fed from 1979 to 1982, at the end of the price inflation of the 1970s. This is chapter 19 of the book, and in my account, it's the Volcker shock, not the election of Reagan that's really the, the driver of this, this transformation that creates the new age of American capitalism. Now, let me just say, I mean, I'm not saying the Volcker shock is like the singular cause of every single post-1980 economic trend I'm going to be talking about. 
but rather it's the central event in the larger sequence of, from which this new era takes shape. It's really mostly a story of unintended consequences. If you read the transcript of the Federal Open Market Committee, they really didn't know what was going to follow from, from their actions. I mean, they're, they're, they're concerned about price stability. They're concerned about the dollar, and this shows the dollar. Those are two things they're always talking about. But beyond that, they're, they're, I wouldn't say they're flying blind, but they're not worried about the larger macro patterns that are going to ensue from their actions, which is quite striking because under Volcker, as we know, the central bank becomes the most important policymaking arm in the United States and arguably the world, um, and arguably it, it remains so to this day. Now, that, that responsibility was dropped in Volcker's lap by President Jimmy Carter. He nominated Volcker in 1979 after the U.S. had failed to tame the price inflation of the 1970s. So basically, Carter punts um, inflation, punts the economy to the Fed before Reagan's election. October 79, Volcker surprises Carter, surprised Wall Street uh, by adopting monetarist doctrines, targeting the aggregate money, money supply, not interest rates directly. Interest rates are going to set themselves in the market, given a tightened supply of money, and of course, interest rates soar. As Volcker put it, the dragon of inflation, eating out our innards, um, had been slayed. This is the index Volcker was looking at inflation expectations. That achieves price stability, no minor matter. Uh, but the Volcker shock was also part of a broader, really global economic reboot. High interest rates, choking credit, uh, led to a sharp double dip recession in the US from 1980 to 1982. High US rates, in fact, plunged the world into recession, brought down commodity prices, especially oil, helped with inflation. Much of the world remained in a downturn in the 1980s, the decade that saw Latin America, uh, Latin American African debt crises, states that had borrowed heavily in dollars from U.S. and U.K. banks, recycled petrodollars that now suffered from the new high interest rate environment that can't roll over their debts. But while much of the world remained depressed, beginning in 1982, uh, the U.S. enjoys a long macroeconomic expansion, which lasted over the 1980s. Let me talk about this recession first, the 80-82 recession, uh, and then talk about the post volcker shock expansion in the 80s, kind of broadening out to the larger characteristic of the age of chaos. First, from the volcker shock, uh, we get a new form of U.S. global economic hegemony. The post-war decades, the U.S., like most world hegemons in the past, exports goods, exports capital. The interest rate shocks brings enormous inflows of capital into the U.S., uh, seeking high interest rates, bids up uh, the dollar. So the new post volcker shock configuration, the U.S. is an importer of capital, and the U.S. ever more be becomes the consumer market of last resort for the world as the high dollar undermines U.S. manufacturers like steel and auto exposed to international uh, competition and trade. Reagan's tax cuts and budget deficits also uh, certainly contributed here. Uh, but you get a phenomenon where uh, this is billions of dollars. You can see this reversal in the, uh, the balance of trade. And this is percentage of GDP to give you a sense of this post uh pattern as it works across the 20th century. But you get a pattern. I mean, in the 1980s, Japanese savings arriving in the U.S. is helping to finance U.S. budget deficits and U.S. Uh, consumer purchases of, of Japanese goods. And that pattern is going to iterate into the 21st century, especially, as you can see, uh, with the rise of, of China. As for U.S. steel and auto, during this early 80s recession, there's a, a massive corporate purge of fixed capital in the historic Northeast, Midwest, U.S. manufacturing belt. It's been the anchor of U.S. manufacturing since really uh, the 1880s. This is Richard Serra's uh, Carnegie in Pittsburgh. Uh, it's upside down, right? The kind of foundation which had, had thought to be industry has now been overturned uh, in this era of deindustrialization. The U.S. industry, the 70s is a decade of profitless prosperity in industry. You know, what begins to change, I can only touch on this briefly, uh, is a new corporate conception of, of investment. It comes from financial economics. It comes from American business school. The portfolio theory of the firm, rather than fixed assets, 
uh, the corporation's capital consists of competing claims on resources, each promising their own risk-weighted expected return. So portfolio theorists make heroic assumptions about liquidity, about the ability of corporations to move resources across asset classes. What first puts it into practice is the Volcker shock. High rates, corporations begin to hoard, begin to part cash uh, and earn interest rates as opposed to investing long, long term. So interest rate accrual, uh, which accounted for about 1% of profits of non-financial corporations uh, in the 1970s, between 79 and 82, during the Volcker shock, uh, the number goes up to 31.4%. So a lot of non-financial corporations just earning uh, profits on interest rate accrual. And that's kind of step one. High interest rates, interest rate accrual, as companies start to hoard uh, cash and disinvest from industry in the Northeast and the Midwest. The one place I look at is Lackawanna, to say, Lackawanna, New York. This is the Bethlehem uh, steel work. Now, because of U.S. labor law, Steel workers, their unions, they have no say in corporate investment decisions. And so when corporations disinvested and factories are shut down, it's experienced as a kind of shock. This is Benjamin Boofer. He says, well, things had got to be booming pretty good, plants going like crazy, and then things fell apart completely one day. This is Kenneth Sion. Everything was booming, and all of a sudden it stopped just like that. That's actually not true. Uh, steel wasn't booming at all. But workers were experienced this moment uh, as a shock, so resonating with the broader idea of a culture shock in, in general. Okay, when the Fed relents and ends the monetarist experiment in 82, you get a business expansion, but a very different logic of investment uh, comes about. Let me just, one example from this moment, a, a company I'm interested in, Union Carbide, it's a petrochemical company. During 7982, they massively disinvest from the Midwest, they first shift to interest rate accrual and other kinds of financial strategies. They also begin to invest in new uh, polyethylene plants in, in Houston, which is where we're about to, to go. Uh, but here's how Union Carbide managers describe their changing conception of investment in this period. This is from a 1985 interview. I'm quoting, I think the basic problem of our business in the 1970s is that we had fallen in love with our production process. It's such a miracle to make the whole thing work that sometimes we forget that it's a business. The only reason I can think that we put so much capacity into unprofitable plant, today that disease is compounded by change. Things are moving so fast, it's absolutely necessary for us to avoid heavy commitments. So if step one during the recession is interest rate accrual, step two after 82 is a turn towards short-term profit-making through capital gains on, on liquid assets, riding the credit cycle. But interest accrual as a component of financial or portfolio income for U.S. manufacturing firms, manufacturing firms, in 1978, portfolio income was 18% of total profit. By 1990, it was 60%. So at the end of this decade, manufacturing companies are making the majority of their profits through finance and not through manufacturing. Here, I think Carter, Carter, but also Reagan's deregulatory efforts uh, in financial markets mattered, you know, mattered a lot. So the New Deal state had siloed capital and credit markets, creating walls geographically and also in a regulatory sense that kind of blocked the free movement of, of, of capital. I'm going to come back. Ah, that's Sion. Uh, that slides out of place. I'm going to come back to this, uh, this Drexel, Burnham, and Lambert painting. Uh, that shows the kind of free, I think, shows the free movement of capital and credit in this period. One interconnecting line. The New Deal wasn't like that. It blocked movement. It blocked the movement of capital uh, across industry. First under Carter and then Reagan, all these barriers come down, and we have more flows of capital and credit moving across the economy. We also have more capital and credit coming in from ab abroad, given the Volcker shock. At the same time, we have, because of the fear of the return of inflation, relatively high interest rates across the 1980s. This is, uh, okay, we're on, I'm back on the right slide. This, this shows the effect of federal fund rates. You can see in 1984, it's above 10% in the midst of a, a very uh, rapid business. Okay. So this is a very, historically, this is a very strange moment. It's a speculative credit boom at very high interest rate. 
And the last time this happened was the 1920s, after World War I and the restoration of the gold standard, in part as a response to wartime inflation. 1920s, high interest rates, speculative investment boom, set on the New York stock market. Uh, but it's also a speculative investment boom that led, as they can, uh, to long-term productive investment in the 1920s in the expansion of Fortis mass production. Same cycle, really, after the U.S. Civil War. Inflation, return to the gold standard, speculative boom in railroads at high rates, crash in 1873. So 1980s, high rates, abundant credit, speculative boom. The big difference is there's no, there's no fixed investment boom whatsoever. I mean, there's nothing in the 1980s like the 1870s railroad expansion or like 1920s mass production. That poses the question of the 1990s new economy and how to relate that to this sequence, but you know, that's the next chapter I can't talk about that. The speculative credit boom at high rates becomes self-fulfilling. High hurdle rate to make a profit in excess of the high cost of the loan. And one way to do that is to juice profits by increasing leverage through more debt. Um, that happened in the 1870s, 1920s, and it happens again in the 1980s. Debts of all kinds, public, household, uh, corporations, surged during the 1980s, and with blips here and there, they keep surging since the 1980s. U.S. corporate debt doubled during the 1980s. That takes us back here. There's a rise of the new junk uh, bond market led by uh, Direct Bill Burnham and Lambert. I was anticipating. Junk bond market for Wall Street leveraged buyouts of industrial corporations, leveraged buyouts using debt, using leverage to ramp up profits, appealing to uh, the new ideology in corporate governance of shareholder value. This often means purging costs, fixed costs, or variable labor costs uh, to deliver returns to shareholders. Second, the chapter I'm, I'm drawing from on the 1980s has a, a, a long section on the commercial real estate market of that decade. One, because it's the world that, 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 that Trump comes from. He was, he was great at this game, though he wasn't good at it anymore, of uh, using debt, using leverage to juice asset prices, live off of borrowing against the asset price appreciation, don't worry so much about the underlying profitability of the business concern itself. In commercial real estate, the 1980s saw the savings and loan scandal, um, the story of the deregulation of thrift, first in response to inflation, uh, then as part of the broader turn towards financial deregulation, new access to credit, use of leverage to book paper profits. So sometimes in the 80s, you find thrifts that are just trading empty office buildings among themselves, back and forth, back and forth, each time booking a profit, which is a premonition of the 2000s. Uh, mortgage-backed securities market, a business model uh, in which, as one banker put it, you buy my triple B tranche and I'll buy yours. It, here's a map I made that actually shows, um, it looks a little fuzzy, doesn't it? Huh, sorry. Um, that actually shows an overlay of the 2000s mortgage crisis and the 1980s savings and loan crisis. So you can see they're always happening in the same kind of regions of the United States in these kind of sunbelt economies. These economies really rely upon real estate and services tied to real estate. So here's how I characterize this broader transformation in the book as the rise of a new political economy of asset price appreciation. So in the post-war period, Income growth was more tied uh, to the depreciation of capital. You build a factory, you produce income, profits, pay, by using the factory. Using the capital, the value of the factory depreciates or loses value over time. It's fixed capital, it's stuck on the ground. Labor can contest, you know, sociologically, the income that gets produced by the factory, and it can translate productivity gains into pay gains. This is hourly, median hourly compensation of net productivity. You can see these lines run together in the post-war period until they do not anymore. So I refer to this as an area defined by income politics, the politics of pay, of labor earnings from the income yielded from investment in, in a liquid asset. 
And politically in this capitalism, the central figure is the white male breadwinner. So we're back to this kind of idea that we see in, in, in Lackawanna at Bethlehem Steel in the 1970s. It's a political economy that in fits and starts. It comes out of industrial revolution and it really culminates the decades after the Second World War. After 1980, income generation shifts uh, towards property through liquid asset price appreciation aided by leverage and debt. Stock market's up, real estate up. That throws off income to property owners or to members of the financial and business service class, lawyers, accountants, bankers, etc., even if it takes the form of, of pay or labor earnings to those uh, categories of employment. This creates new patterns of rising inequality, certainly, uh, if income generation shifts towards property away from labor. It also creates, during the 1980s, first, a booming service employment, whether high wage, uh, financial and business services, or low wage, historically feminized jobs in services like healthcare or retail that feature very low productivity and pay. To give just a sense of this and also to talk about one of my future projects, uh, the book has a small section on, on the city of, of Houston. Uh, this is the great postmodern architect Philip Johnson's pencil place, place from the 1970s where you have a sense of a break, a sharp break or discontinuity in the 19, 1970s from an industrial to a post-industrial moment. Uh, Houston's the fastest growing city in the United States for a long time. It remains so in the 1980s. These are from different angles, but you can see downtown Houston in 1980, and then you can see it in 1990. And seemingly, every one of these post-1980 trends I'm talking about, global financial inflows, feminization of work, the rise of the services, inequality, debt, low productivity growth, uh, an automobile-based city premised on oil, Houston, that you know, doubles down on fossil fuel energy consumption during the decade of the 1980s that, that saw uh, the first scientific confirmation of, of anthropogenic climate change. All these trends are just piling up in Houston. And you know, there's only one Wall Street, there's only, there's only one Silicon Valley. But this model, this Houston model can play, right? It can spread throughout other parts of, of the country. Now, oil refinery and petrochemical plants like Union Carbide they make Houston by 1980 the fourth largest industrial city uh, in terms of value added. But the, the manufacturing labor force is very lean, it's low wage, and it's not at all unionized. Now, nationally, real hourly compensation for men, it flatlines after 1972. But in Houston, male wages are far below the national average. So already in the 1970s, Houston has a very high rate of female labor force participation, which means that household, in, in, household income inequality, which rises in the 1980s, but it's tempered by the entry of women into the labor force, it's already happened in Houston. So household inequality explodes in Houston, and the rest of the nation kind of catches up with that trend uh, in the 1990s. Houston's growth is spatial. Its largest growth sector uh, is real estate development, very high turnover rate. There's no zoning in Houston, planless city, uh, build, tear down, build. This is uh, from 2014. You can fit Detroit, Philadelphia, Chicago, and Baltimore inside of Houston, and the Houston metro area is now larger than the state of New Jersey. Okay, so it's funded by Wall Street, also global capital, Middle Eastern oil-based sovereign wealth funds, Latin American capital fleeing the Latin American debt crisis after the Volcker shock. But real estate. Uh, is highly leveraged. This is like a, this is also a Philip Johnson building, but it's just this commercial skyscraper built out in the middle of nowhere with the hope that then development will circle around it. it highly leveraged, highly speculative. Houston, Texas is ground zero for the savings and loans, commercial real estate uh, crisis of the 1980s, but also residential real estate. So very high rate of household mortgage debt. Little employment uh, growth or wage growth in industry, although there's lots of construction jobs for men, that, that's important. Um, but just prodigious growth in the services. Again, highly paid, highly educated business services, accountants, real estate appraisers, real estate developers, uh, but also very low paid retail, healthcare, 
food preparation for child care. So nationally, now nationally, 90% of all American jobs created in the post-1983 expansion, 90% were in government, hemp work, schools, health care, or retail trade. These are all low productivity regions of the economy. So if you expand this kind of economic activity, this kind of urban model of economic development, you're going to have a lower uh, trend line of productivity uh, and also wage growth, which is what we see happen across the 1980s. So the Houston model, prodigious growth tied to real estate and sprawl, uh, but also really sharp inequality tied to flat mean real wage growth. It, Again, relatively high rate of home ownership through mortgage debt, so also another premonition of what's going to happen in the 2000s and the run up towards 2008. Many people start to play the asset price depreciation game, right? Not the increase in pay labor earnings game, but of course, if the game is property, you know, the rich are going to do better at it because they have more of it. All right, let me, um, let me start to, yeah, to conclude. I'm going to conclude. So as I said, much of the world experienced an economic downturn over the 1980s. Uh, the United States, almost uniquely, in the case of Japan, is being really important too, uh, enjoys a boom. A and that's an achievement. Um, inflation was tamed, that's no small matter. And many economies experiencing some kind of 1970s industrial malaise tied to a larger political legitimation crisis, turned to debt in search of renewal. Most tried to use debt to double down on some kind of heavy metal industrialism. Most all to fail. Most famously, much of communist Eastern Europe goes to the capital market only to suffer a debilitating debt crisis. And we know that communism was not able to chart uh, anything like a post-industrial future and, and, and collapse at the end of this decade. And capitalism instead transformed, and, and the U.S. does, I think, chart a new path, the path I've been talking about today, and that's, that's good. Um, that's a good thing. I mean, there's no reason, at least in my view, you know, to be nostalgic for post-war industrial society in any of its um, variety. At the same time, in the new capitalism that emerges from the 1980s, you know, many troubling patterns. Dependence on debt of all kinds for demand, especially given the rise of inequality, stalling wage growth. Dependence on leverage for profits, uh, especially given uh, what's a very quickly, I think clearly a bloated U.S. financial sector uh, of, of arguable economic, uh, let alone social value. It, low trend line rates in productivity growth uh, due to the explosion of employment in, in the services. So we come back here you know, about the weakness uh, of, of the inducement to invest long term, what we should expect to be the norm. Uh, and, and the broader turn towards liquidity preference, which I think does capture a lot of the dynamics I've been describing. In the 1980s, U.S. macroeconomic expansion uh, uniquely uh, saw a declining share fixed non-residential investment uh, GDP. The only decade that sees that. I'm sorry these slides are blurry. I don't know what happened. You see a very sharp decline in fixed investment given uh, the turn toward investment in liquid assets. And indeed, the beginning of, through financial engineering, the capacity of Wall Street to synthetically create a burgeoning new supply of liquid assets to satisfy the demand for them, which led infamously in the 2000s uh, to the mortgage-backed securities market and, and the financial crisis of 2008, an extraordinary bailout of the U.S. economy, successful bailout on their own terms uh, by the Fed, which turned out to be just a dress rehearsal. Uh, for the even more dramatic COVID intervention. So I started this last part of the talk with the Fed and how unintentionally uh, the Volcker shock led to a self-fulfilling speculative credit boom at high rates. The booms at high rates are particularly perilous. Credit cycle reverses, 
expensive, outstanding loads uh, can make a crisis more acute. However, there's a final, I think, meaning or significance to uh, the Volcker shock. It's not just the high rates. Um, as early as 1982, when the Fed bailed out U.S. commercial banks, especially Citibank, uh, during the Mexican peso crisis, the international result of the high interest rate shock, uh, the Fed makes very clear that it, in addition to maintaining price stability, it's committed to backstopping asset prices, either through lowering interest rates, loans, bailouts, or eventually asset purchases. So, you know, just the 1980s, the 1982 Mexican peso crisis, 1984 U.S. commercial banking crisis, 1987 stock market market crash when a new Fed chairman, Alan Greenspan, announced the Fed's, quote, readiness to serve as a source of liquidity uh, to the savings and loans prices already described. That's just the 1980s. Uh, government authorities have proved their willingness time and again to, to backstop this new political economy of asset price appreciation to ensure macroeconomic stability. And I think this helps explain another trend of the U.S. economy since the 1980s, which is the elongation of business cycles, or what Ben Bernanke labeled in 2004, great moderation. For economic development is led by, by debt, so long as the Fed can ensure and ease and support credit conditions, it's possible for expansion, if of a very certain kind, uh, to elongate and continue. And in the epilogue to the book, I argue the period since the 1980s represents not so much a great moderation, uh, but a great repetition of business cycles bearing striking, striking similarities uh, to what I've described and detailed you know, looking at the 1980s. Um, you know, the Volcker shock, it, again, it may have initiated the series of events that brought this new economic situation to life, but, but beyond design price stability, if you look at the archives, if you look at the records, Volcker, the Fed, they really did it with no long-term vision for the economy whatsoever. And in the midst of, of the interest rate shock, Volcker, again, arguably the world's most important economic policymaker, to his credit, he's always saying to his colleagues behind closed doors, this is from 1982, during the Mexican peso crisis, the meeting where they decide what they're going to bailout Citibank, he, Volcker says, one can speculate about everything. I don't know what is going to happen. I don't know how to do this. Which is a striking confession, but I think is uh, very indicative of this age of, of chaos, an age of without kind of long-term uh, political control or direction over economic life. Now, resonating with Volcker's remarks, American workers who, who lost their factory jobs during the 1980s, but did land on their feet, finding employment, finding work in the services or also in self-employment, were often quick to, to qualify their fate. I don't quite know how it happened. I got lucky. I lucked out. I guess, go back to Benjamin Buffer, who after he lost his job as a steel worker, uh, cut firewood uh, for sale. I guess in the new world, there's going to be a good opportunity if you can get a good education. But it looks a little bit to me that everybody is going to have to be smart, and the ones that get it are going to be lucky. So I'll stop there. Uh, thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to try to answer any questions you might have. Thank you so much. Uh, I think the most rational way of doing this is if, uh, in order to get the amplification, which you see is necessary, um, in order to get the amplification, if you go to the microphones um, that are positioned in both the rows. Um, but while you're doing this, maybe I could begin uh, the question uh, session. I thought it was just a wonderful a taste of the book and of the rich contents of the book. Um, it struck me, this is a history of the United States, and the way also you think about capitalism is very much linked to specific uh, 
legal mechanisms and specific laws and uh, securities laws and uh, laws about uh, the taxation of debt and tax relief and uh, inheritance law and, and so on and so on. So um, capitalism is really an international phenomenon. And you started off with the international character of capitalism. Um, but it's also peculiarly shaped by national circumstances. And so I wondered, could you contemplate a world in which you do exactly this kind of exercise for other countries? And how would it look? And in particular, you know, I'm struck by the question of the interplay of these countries, because um, you know, one of the stories I think you could tell as an alternative in the 1970s is that this was a period in which in the United States, but also in many, many other countries, uh, the share of trade uh, goes up dramatically. So uh, th th there's a great surge in exports and imports, uh, sh uh, sh surge in, 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 in commerce. Uh, people think about opening, and that's true in Europe, it's true in India, it's uh, true and I think, uh, you know, obviously most spectacularly in a way, you know, also a kind of turning point in 1978, 1979 is the advent of uh, Deng Xiaoping in uh, Chinese policy making. Uh, so that a different, you know, obviously a logically different model of capitalism then starts to operate, but it has kind of resemblances. And so you end up with a paradox that the world's most dynamic capitalist economy is ruled by a communist party. It's an absolutely extraordinary uh, paradox. So, you know, I wondered, first of all, um, how international comparisons work. And secondly, could you give more ro of a role to trade in your story? Because, uh, you know, for the story of uh, working class incomes, it, 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 it obviously in the conventional literature plays a really, really big role in that. And thanks. And then please, if you, if you come to the front um, and uh, prepare to ask questions, uh, that would be great. Thank you. Thanks, Sean. I mean, a number of, of, of thoughts in, in response to the, to the question. You know, maybe I could have emphasized this, this more in the book. I mean, typically we think of trade as uh, heavily shaping uh, the export-led economies of this era in terms of the interna international competition. Japan, West Germany, 70s, moving forward, East Asian economies, eventually China. Now, the U.S. is such a big economy that when you look at trade, it's a very small percentage of economic activity, and so it's often discounted. But I think you're right that in my account, implicit, not explicit, is even though it's a very tiny percentage of economic activity, it's very important, very important in terms of parting the fate of the American industrial economy and its relationship to the rise of service. Also, Houston is a global, global city, uh, tied into the Middle East, certainly through oil, tied into Latin America. But I think there are, there are moments when the global scale, there are moments in the book that I think, I think the book does a great job with the global scale. There are moments where I think it actually doesn't. It's just kind of the way it is. You know, I, I agree, or I was at least persuaded by something Jeremy Edelman once said about the need to write global history from a place. And so even though it is a history of the United States, it did try to incorporate the, the global scale. But I guess I'm more convinced that if we're going to write a global history of capitalism, that historians are going to have to start doing something they don't like to do, which is Because it's really just impossible. I mean, I exhausted myself trying to do, to do this, to just do the U.S. I, I think that, that, you know, hopefully the account you get in the U.S. could resonate with other countries and the kind of analysis would be fruitful for, for people to think along with. But to really do the, the global, I think we'll probably uh, have to do it, you know, together. Yes, um, you stole some of my thunder there with that answer, but uh, I, I'd just be curious to get a little bit more thoughts on your your ideas on you know mon you you focused on monetary policy is yeah. probably the preeminent or certainly the mm -hmm. first among equals as as a factor 
that resonates, um, you know, from the late seventies onwards here and has helped to really shape the world we've known over the last few uh, decades. But what other, if you were pressed to say, okay, here's number two or, or, or the three, I mean, to, to my mind, it seems like you probably would throw in as you probably intimate talked about here, globalization. Mm -hmm. Um, but I would also wonder your thoughts on at the same time, the rise of technology, computer technology yeah. as well. Um, you know, those, those, those factors, you know, monetary policy, globalization, uh, computer technology or something else. I mean, but if you have to move out beyond that, what, yeah. what, what immediately, what's on the short list there? I mean, just a few thoughts on, on each. Uh, the, the 1980s, uh, I think you have to get further on. And, and, and the book stops in 2010. By the time you get there, you know, the global scale, especially when it comes to the dollar, you know, it's, 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 not, it's not clear if it's the global scale, if it's right to just think of U.S. hegemony. You know, I mean, I think by the time you get to the 20, 21st century, there are a number of global interests in, in the dollar, a global interest in the U.S. capital market absorbing credit and funds, and the U.S. consumer market absorbing the wor world's goods. I, I, I wouldn't say we're, we're there in the 1980s. Certainly 1990s globalization, financial globalization, trade globalization. By the time we're in the new century, e certainly the U.S. is the global economic hegemon. Certainly, the U.S. enjoys the exorbitant privilege of printing the world's reserve currency. But I, I think you actually have to think about, and China comes to mind, you know, the interest outside of the United States in propping up a particular kind of U.S. global economic hegemony that first came about with the Volcker shock. That's kind of one thought about globalization. Technology is a great question. You know, the 1980s does see uh, the Apple IPO. It does see... Uh, really important advancement in biotechnology, both in terms of technological innovation and being able to take things to, to, to market. But really, the 1990s new economy is really the moment we think of as being particularly innovative technologically. And in this era, you know, the late 1990s is kind of the exception that proves the rule. You, know, you do have a, a huge fixed investment boom. You do have rates of productivity going up. You do have, especially at the end of the business expansion, although I think it's a macroeconomic phenomenon, you know, a tightening of wage uh, inequality. Uh, but the 20 years since then haven't looked like that. You know, um, not, not at all. So it, 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 in hindsight now, maybe still too early to tell, it looks like more of a blip. And then third, quickly, I just wanted to say, I mean, the Fed is important, but the Fed is part of a broader turn uh, towards the use of administrative e uh, entities to regulate the economy, um, or or the courts too. So you know, one of the the arguments I try to make in this this chapter is uh, the kind of ideology of this period: pro government, anti government, free market, kind of Reaganite ideology. Maybe it's persuasive or not. It's not a very good guide to what actually happened in the 1980s. I mean, deregulation is not really the best way to look at it. You have to think of where regulation moves and where state action moves. And the Fed is part of a broader turn away from the Congress, away from the presidency, towards administrative agencies and towards courts, which are, better or for worse, depending on your opinion, less democratic. So, you know, that, that is a reason for that, that democracy really failed to solve the stagflation crisis of the 70s. And so you have to bring in the Fed uh, to fix the problem. Uh, but again, part of a much broader turn towards administrative state power away from uh, the legislative. I think we alternate between left and right. We alternate between uh, left and right. But let's stay on the left, mostly. Kind of related to that. I have a question about the role of the Fed in the United States. Yep. 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 It's a devastating moment for U.S. Um, labor. It, it, it's a just a huge loss of, of of workers from industrial unions, and it's a it's a devastating 
moment. You know, labor in the 1990s begins to recompose and think about organizing services in, in creative ways. You know, the air workers, the, that, that strike, which Reagan set back and refused to, refused to intervene, is a very important symbolic moment, too. Um, it's the action against strikes that was legal, but that employers had never really thought they could get away with, and, and, they, and they get away with it under the cover of, uh, uh, of Reagan. It, the Fed, I thought I would find a lot of discussion in that event um, when I looked at the Fed transcripts from this moment, and instead I found some, first of all, what they're worried about or constituencies that they're, they're worried about. Instead, I found something different, which is they're, they're worried about um, real estate and construction development being paused by high interest rates. So a lot of uh, building trades, developers, also labor unions would send like two by fours to Volcker saying, I can't use this to build a house because of high interest rates. Again, a shift towards thinking about uh, new kinds of constituencies, new kinds of economic structures, like the real estate uh, as being perhaps more important than, than labor. It relates to the, the last question, or, or at least the answer I tried to give to it. I mean, when Volker, when Volker comes in, you know, coming out of the Depression, coming out of the war, you know, governments thought that you can't, you just couldn't get away with this politically, inducing a massive recession of this kind, right? You couldn't get away with it because labor would contest it, it would push back, you would lose the next election. And, and one, of, one, of the, one, of the, one of the, as you're suggesting, one of the important things about this moment is not only does Volcker do it, but he gets celebrated for doing it. He gets lionized for doing it. And so it's a very important index of the waning of uh, a certain kind of organized U.S. labor interest tied to, to, to uh, industry and manufacturing. I, I, I didn't see anybody at the moment. Uh, I, yes, uh, it was Jeremy. We're hoarding, we're hoarding the microphone over here. Okay. Ah. <laughs> oh, okay, sorry. Um, um, well, I have a meta question and then a very specific question. The meta one, I'm afraid of, it just for everybody here, I'm only at the early 70s in the book. Uh, so it's, it's like only a third of the way in, folks. So, um, uh, but as I'm thinking about you, know, as I've been thinking about your title, uh, ages, uh, yeah. the question, the meta, and, and you don't have to answer it. It's probably geeking out on, yeah. on what your narrative is, but what's, the internal logic of each one of your ages. Is there an arc that you're telling around the way you periodize and you organize the story? And, and the connection to, to the second question, um, I, I think there is a connection, but, well, you'll, you're, you're smarter than me, so you'll figure out what it is, but I think there is a connection, which is around 79, because it's both a structural shift in, in the making of the world economy and the American economy, and yet you end on luck. Like you end on this totally contingent, yep. unplanned, but I've read all your work. You're thinking about future ways of, of modeling time. And um, I don't know whether you're playing with us when you're talking about luck and chance and contingency. Um, so the empirical question is, Who's behind 79? Mm -hmm. I mean, you're starting to give it away now. There are interests at yep. stake. Um, can you talk a little bit more about financialization as the effect or the cause of the 79 shock, I guess, yep. is where I'm going. Yep. Uh, thanks. E, so the first question, that I, I, the answer is that I have a you know, bad proclivity for alliteration. You know? <laughs> so, so all the age, you know, commerce, capital, control. Chaos. But the periodization does have to do with the kind of predominant forms of capital. So, you know, the first era is, is defined by, by land and, in particular, um, slaves. Um, and I guess among historians, maybe this is geeking out. I mean, it's, it's a very long period, and the American Revolution is in the middle of it. And, and in terms of the structure of economic life, you know, the revolution matters in many respects, but actually, I think it's largely, you know, continuity. Yeah. Um, E, and then the second period is a story of, in, of, of industrialization, and it could be the age of industrial capital, but I think it's really important to be attentive to the financial dynamic and the relation between the kind of Keynesian monetary story and the more typical industrialization, self-sustained growth story, which I think are dynamics internal to capital itself, and they're 
in that period particularly prominent, both in terms of productivity gains with Fordism and the just extreme macroeconomic volatility that culminated in the Great Depression. It, and then third and fourth obviously speak to your last question because control and chaos evoke very different um, very different um, uh, something very different with respect to the question of, of luck. You know, um, this is just an anecdote, but when, when FDR went off the gold standard, you know, he and the Treasury Secretary, um, uh, Henry Morgenthau, would, they'd have breakfast every morning and they'd decide what the, 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 the gold price of dollars would be. You know, they'd sit there. And there's one morning where FDR said, well, I'm going to get it wrong. I don't know the exact number, but, you know, they're talking about the cents. Oh, you know, 33. And Warren said, why 33? And FDR said, that's my favorite number. <laughs> All right. So it's kind of contingent because it just depends on what FDR's favorite number had to be. <laughs> but at the same time, when I read that, I thought, wow, you know, coming after the era of the gold standard, right. which is supposed to take these Talk questions about control. Yeah, right. out of politics, you have FDR drinking his coffee, deciding, right? And, and so now, you know, we have a long era and, and it's very complicated. But I think, and of course, I'm very critical of the New Deal state in the book um, for not having, I think, robust enough uh, programs of, of public investment or, or kind of giving up on certain kinds of public private uh, models of investment like uh, you know, the Reconstruction Finance Corporation and for not adequately controlling the investment function. And by the time he's 1950s, 60s, using tax credits and subsidies to do that instead of being more deliberate and determinate in doing it. But nonetheless, you know, chaos, two things. One, I was just struck reading these transcripts during this shock uh, about their own sense of losing control, right? Even though in hindsight we can kind of very look back at these shifts that look very, very clear and very specific. I was very struck at the degree to which Reagan, they, they're just kind of clueless, you know. But every single thing they said would happen, the opposite happened. You know, we're going to cut taxes, there's going to be an investment boom and a surge in the savings rate and a manufacturing revival. You're like, none of that happened. Um, I think in the 1990s, Clinton, it's a more coherent vision, right, of kind of going all in on a left-center model of financial globalization. Uh, but then none of the things they said would happen would happen either. You know, so has there ever been a moment, and I thought, you know, then I kind of to check myself, well, isn't this always true? You know, when do policymakers ever yeah. deliberately create uh, the outcomes that they intended? But I think there is something distinctive about this period. I think it does have to do with the mobility of capital at the global scale that just makes it really hard for national government to do the things that they want to do and that they say they're going to do. And then second, you know, I end with Buffer talking about luck and chaos too. You know, in the social world, there is a, a, a kind of chaos too. It has to do with the short-term um, quality of investment. It has to do with the collapse of an industrial model. And, and, and really no one knows, and we still don't know, you know what's going to replace it. In intellectual discourse, a you know, whole vocabulary to understand the social world comes out of the era of industrialization, terms like structure. You know, it doesn't quite work. Maybe we'll talk about networks, but it's not really clear. It, I, I think there is something in this period. Now, maybe it's true of other periods, too. You know, Toynbee named the Industrial Revolution he gave in a series of lectures he gave in 1889. So it was a century after the Industrial Revolution. It took a long time for people to kind of make industrial modernity legible and controllable. And then once they did, they quickly lost control because the ground shifted from underneath their feet. So, you know, perhaps, I hope, you know, we'll see something like that happen. But I, I don't, I, I still think that this period um, is different and, and unique and, and warrants, um, you know, the designation chaos. And it's a C, right? And once you've had commerce, capital, and control, you want to have another C. If you have a second, right? Mm -hmm. um, so you don't talk too much about sort of policy ideas. Yeah. Uh, I know that's not really historian's yeah. job, but yeah. um, your framing of needing inducement um, to invest makes me think about uh, Piketty's argument for a wealth tax, yeah. that it actually, it, it's taxing idle yeah. wealth and a transaction tax would tax the sort of looking yeah. 
for a short run gain. Yep. Uh, do you think about, you know, what would it take to get people? And then of course, if you raise the revenue, you can do more purposeful investment yeah, yeah, yeah. on the public side. Yep. So I was curious what you thought about, you know, policy uh, solutions to the chaos yeah, you're talking I mean, you know, about. You're right. I'm not an expert on those subjects, but you know, yes, yes, yes. Like I think that that's kind of the, the right direction to go. I guess the one thing I would contribute, which I think does come from a historical uh, perspective on those issues is one of the reasons why um, those kinds of policies, uh, the extent to which they were practiced or tried, failed in the kind of high era of New Deal liberalism is they're tied to a, a, a national imagination of the economy, having to do with the birth of macroeconomics, um, that thinks about things like GDP or the very possibility of a kind of aggregate like investment it, and it, 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 it abstracted from particular places, regions and local economy. And so I, I think that that, and you know, there's a, there's a deindustrialization, the rise of the Rust Belt, the Sun Belt economy, you know, the ways in which you get kind of regional variation in the American economy gaps in particular places where private investment doesn't go, um, never goes. Um, despite what was promised by kind of late 1990s, you know, celebration of, of financial globalization, uh, that you really have to think about mechanisms that can, you know, localize investment and not just, you know, headline numbers like this piece of legislation is $6 billion or $5 billion. A And then the question of democracy, too, um, which is really problematic when you think about the Fed and its role in governing the economy. The fact that it has very few mechanisms for democratic participation. So I think the regional investment banks, you know, uh, might have it, which are not very democratic institutions at all, but none could be potentially reimagined. Like you could think about ways to uh, think about regional and local development uh, as opposed to the more national, um, you know, or even global scale. So I think that that is one, you know, perhaps. Uh, you know, lesson you could take from, you know, from the book and thinking about these kinds of contemporary issues. Yeah. I think the microphone should be deeper. Are you talking already? And anybody else who wants to come down, please do come down to the front. Thanks very much for a fascinating presentation. And you touched on this theme already in several places, but I was curious to hear your thoughts further on, on inequality, just thinking about the age covered in your book. Yeah. There's this long arc of rising inequality in the Gilded Age, this yeah. compression of inequality yeah. in the mid-20th century, and then recently a great rise in inequality again. Yeah. And you touched on several themes that drive that, one being technology yeah. and sort of the rise of American manufacturing and the creation of middle-class jobs, yeah. but another being policy, the New Deal policies, the rise of yeah. unionization, um, and then more more recently, as we were discussing a moment ago, trade, the role of trade in that. And so I was sort of curious as to your thoughts of the future evolution of inequality and the potential political implications of this, mm -hmm. in particular, the recent decline of the middle class, which historically had been so strong in the US with the yeah. expansion of the frontier, creating an agricultural middle class, and then the mid-century expansion of manufacturing. So I was kind of curious as to how that connects with your, with your thoughts on overall development in terms of the effect across the distribution and the potential political implications of that. Yeah, I mean, I put this um, this fuzzy. Let's go back to this fuzzy chart if I can find it. Um, sorry, uh, which is just crazy, you know, when you when you, when you look at it. Um, so so clearly, there there is a a, a mechanism. Um, I argue, right? There's a, a mechanism that connects liquidity preference to increasing um, inequality uh, and that you are shifting income to, to property ownership. And this is, of course, a well-documented um, you know, statistical fact in this era. You know, we typically think about, and I think uh, you know, Piketty uh, urges us, I think he's right, to think about this in terms of tax policy. Um, and redistribution is tax policy. I think that's absolutely correct. But there's also people, and I think here the, the book might be might be helpful to talk about pre-distribution, of kind of reimagining um, what economic, uh, what labor markets might look like, what the economy might look like before we have to then intervene at, at the level of, 
of taxation. I guess what's, what's when you, there's a lot of things to say about this chart and a lot of different things you have to bring to bear to explain it. What, one thing I, I think is, is important um, is U.S. labor law, just to go back to the question earlier. What's amazing about those post-war decades, U.S. labor law is adversarial. You know, unions have the ability to contest wages and working conditions, but U.S. labor law, labor unions have no say in um, corporate investment decisions, unlike other um, countries who have different different labor system. And so, you know, coming out of the war, I mean, you could almost track that metric. You know, GM coming out of 45, you know, it's, it, it's thinking of its investments in investment horizon for 30 years. That's the standard kind of street line depreciation coming out of the war. And there's a huge boom of investment after the war and then a lot of kind of maintenance through this period. And that's the kind of line you're seeing. Once you start to see capital mobility it, there's just not much that labor can really do to exercise a voice uh, in these kinds of, kinds of patterns. So we're back to, I think, the most urgent question facing us, which is not so much capitalism, but really democracy, um, which I, I think is probably the issue to, to worry about most for some pretty urgent reasons that, that text the headline. Um, but again, I don't think, say, taxation is just going to do the trick, although by all means um, it, it could help. Uh, but you're going to have to think about redistributing power in the um, and, and ways to do that institutionally. Um, I think if you really want to reverse those, you know, those changes, and of course the New Deal represented a version of that that worked until it didn't work anymore, which is what you can see here. Can we turn to the left side of the board, sorry? Mm -hmm. It's a great question, um, and uh, sorry, I'm just thinking about the like, you know, the, by the end of the, the the book's too long, but you know, but by the end of it, I tried to limit each chapter to like no more than eleven thousand words. And so I'm just thinking about like the original 32,000 word draft of this chapter, which really indicated the struggle that you are um, um, suggesting took place and which did take place. And I guess something one of my former teachers at the University of Chicago, I quoted him earlier at our lunch today, it's a different Bill Sewell quote. But, you know, he used to always say like historians, when they get in trouble, they always try to narrate their way you know, out of the mess, when usually there's a conceptual problem or, or a lack of kind of conceptual clarity. So I think actually, um, um, I mean, I was so pleased for, for Harold to kind of mention the conceptual apparatus of the book. And the reason I worked so hard on it was because I had these chapters who were just kind of spilling out of, you know, control. And I needed, I needed that to try to figure out what goes out and, and what goes in and what, what should be selected. And then, and then, of course, you're right. This is just kind of personal idiosyncratic preference. I like to work across different scales. It's fun. Um, so, so there's also that, too. But, yeah, but, it, but, it, but, it, but to kind of get the book short enough so that somebody would publish it, um, you know, it, it required working on the conceptual apparatus. I mean, I guess that is, you know, the answer to your question. Yeah. 
Okay, yeah. There are two more questions. Uh, so first, again, on the left, and then we'll go to the right. Mm -hmm. uh, I take it that um, towards the end of Yeah. And um, it's really chaos. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I like the question. Did I get okay? Take the, yep. the other question. Let's do it. After it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Well, I, I, I was going to sort of take you out of your book for a second okay. and sort of pick your brain based on what has been happening since 2010 mm -hmm. um, and sort of this whole cryptocurrency yeah. disruption, yeah. no rules, yeah. um, no way of looking at capitalism outside the Fed or outside yeah. US rules yeah. um, and to see if you were somehow provoked by that whole what's happening now yeah. um, as a future book. Oh. oh, wow. Um, I'll try to answer both questions together. Uh, uh, I like the Machiavelli reference. That's, that's, that's fantastic. What does the prince do? In the face of uncertainty and fortune, you know, through virtuous, vigorous, energetic exercise, it kind of creates, creates the future. Um, and I think that there is a way of... of of retelling the history of economic expertise in the 20th century through that, um, through that vision. And, and again, takes us back to the confidence, one might say hubris, that kind of post-war MIT Keynesianism had in its ability to kind of manage the macroeconomy, uh, really thinking it kind of solve those problems through uh, the kind of bold, confident, intellectual, energetic activity that Machiavelli cited through Volcker, who's being celebrated, right, for doing that. But actually, if you read the, arc, read the records, he doesn't feel very confident at all. Um, so that, that's a nice catch. Where does that confidence then go? Well, it seems to go to uh, the kind of people bold enough in the Machiavellian sense to create synthetic digital assets you know, out of nothing and to convince people that they should invest their money um, in them. <laughs> I mean, that's a, that's a pretty Machiavellian um, move. I don't have much to say about, you know, cryptocurrency, but I, I mean, I, in a way, I wasn't thinking about it, but the kind of um, way of understanding capital and conceptualizing assets and the economy around assets, I mean, and in a way, kind of crypto is a sort of, car a kind of caricature. Of, of, of that vision of kind of what makes the economy uh, tick. So it, it's a good association, and I hadn't thought about, I'm not thinking about my next book yet, but hey, thanks for the, thanks for the idea. Mm -hmm. Plug a upcoming public event on cryptocurrency, uh, November 19th. Um, it's on Zoom, yeah? It's on Zoom. It's open to the public. You just get to register, and uh, we'll answer all your questions there. Excellent. Thank you. And uh, there's an important announcement because uh, John isn't disappearing immediately. He's going next door, and he's going to sign copies of the book. So uh, if you if you uh, want to buy a copy of the book, and I urge you to do that, uh, please uh, go next door. Thank you so much for a great presentation. Yeah.